Book One, Chapter Twelve of Anna Karenina, read for LibriVox.org by Kirsten Ferreri. The young princess Kitty Sterbatskaya was eighteen. It was the first winter that she had been out in the world. Her success in society had been greater than that of either her elder sisters, and greater even than her mother had anticipated. To say nothing of the young men who danced at the Moscow balls being almost all in love with Kitty, two serious suitors had already this first winter made their appearance, Levine, and immediately after his departure, Count Vronsky. Levine's appearance at the beginning of the winter— his frequent visits, and evident love for Kitty, had led to the first serious conversations between Kitty's parents as to her future, and to disputes between them. The prince was on Levine's side. He said he wished for nothing better for Kitty. The princess, for her part, going round the question in the manner peculiar to women, maintained that Kitty was too young, that Levine had done nothing to prove that he had serious intentions, that Kitty felt no great attraction to him, and other side issues, but she did not state the principal point, which was that she looked for a better match for her daughter, and that Levine was not to her liking, and she did not understand him. When Levine had abruptly departed, the princess was delighted, and said to her husband triumphantly, "'You see, I was right.' When Vronsky appeared on the scene, she was still more delighted, confirmed in her opinion that Kitty was to make not simply a good, but a brilliant match. In the mother's eyes there could be no comparison between Vronsky and Levine. She disliked in Levine his strange and uncompromising opinions, and his shyness in society, founded, as she supposed, on his pride and his queer sort of life, as she considered it, absorbed in cattle and peasants. She did not very much like it that he, who was in love with her daughter, had kept coming to the house for six weeks as though he were waiting for something, inspecting, as though he were afraid he might be doing them too great an honour by making an offer, and did not realise that a man who continually visits at a house where there is a young unmarried girl is bound to make his intentions clear. And suddenly, without doing so, he disappeared. "'It's as well he's not attractive enough for Kitty to have fallen in love with him,' thought the mother." Vronsky satisfied all the mother's desires, very wealthy, clever, of aristocratic family, on the high road to a brilliant career in the army and at court, and a fascinating man. Nothing better could be wished for. Vronsky openly flirted with Kitty at balls, danced with her, and came continually to the house. Consequently, there could be no doubt of the seriousness of his intentions. But in spite of that, the mother had spent the whole of that winter in a state of terrible anxiety and agitation. Princess Sherbatskaya had herself been married thirty years ago, her aunt arranging the match. Her husband, about whom everything was well known beforehand, had come, looked at his future bride, and been looked at. The matchmaking aunt had ascertained and communicated their mutual impression. That impression had been favourable. Afterwards, on a day fixed beforehand, the expected offer was made to her parents and accepted. All had passed very simply and easily. So it seemed at least to the princess— but over her own daughters she had felt how far from simple and easy is the business, apparently so commonplace, of marrying off one's daughters. The panics that had been lived through, the thoughts that had been brooded over, the money that had been wasted, and the disputes with her husband over marrying the two eldest girls, Daria and Natalia. Now, since the youngest had come out, she was going through the same terrors, the same doubts, and still more violent quarrels with her husband than she had over the elder girls. The old prince, like all fathers indeed, was exceedingly punctilious on the score of the honour and reputation of his daughters, especially over Kitty, who was his favourite. At every turn he had scenes with the princess for compromising her daughter. The princess had grown accustomed to this already with her other daughters, but now she felt that there was more ground for the prince's touchiness. She saw that of late years much was changed in the manners of society, that a mother's duties had become still more difficult. She saw that girls of Kitty's age formed some sort of clubs, went to some sort of lectures, mixed freely in men's society, drove about the streets alone, many of them did not curtsy, and what was the most important thing, all the girls were firmly convinced that to choose their husbands was their own affair, and not their parents. Marriages aren't made nowadays as they used to be, was thought and said by all these young girls, and even by their elders. But how marriages were made now the princess could not learn from any one. The French fashion of the parents arranging their children's future was not accepted. It was condemned. The English fashion of the complete independence of girls was also not accepted, and not possible in Russian society. 
The Russian fashion of matchmaking by the offices of intermediate persons was for some reason considered unseemly. It was ridiculed by every one and by the princess herself. But how girls were to be married, and how parents were to marry them, no one knew. Every one with whom the princess had chanced to discuss the matter said the same thing. Mercy on us! It's high time in our day to cast off all that old-fashioned business. It's the young people have to marry, and not their parents, and so we ought to leave the young people to arrange it as they choose. It was very easy for any one to say that who had no daughters, but the princess realized that in the process of getting to know each other, her daughter might fall in love, and fall in love with someone who did not care to marry her, or who was quite unfit to be her husband. And however much it was instilled into the princess that in our times young people ought to arrange their lives for themselves, she was unable to believe it, just as she would have been unable to believe that at any time whatever the most suitable playthings for children five years old ought to be loaded pistols. And so the princess was more uneasy over Kitty than she had been over her elder sisters. Now she was afraid that Vronsky might confine himself simply to flirting with her daughter. She saw that her daughter was in love with him, but tried to comfort herself with the thought that he was an honorable man, and would not do this. But at the same time she knew how easy it is, with the freedom of manners to-day, to turn a girl's head, and how lightly men generally regard such a crime. The week before, Kitty had told her mother of a conversation she had with Vronsky during a mazurka. This conversation had partly reassured the princess, but perfectly at ease she could not be. Vronsky had told Kitty that both he and his brother were so used to obeying their mother that they never made up their minds to any important undertaking without consulting her. And just now I am impatiently awaiting my mother's arrival from Petersburg, as peculiarly fortunate, he told her. Kitty had repeated this without attaching any significance to the words, but her mother saw them in a different light. She knew that the old lady was expected from day to day, that she would be pleased at her son's choice, and she felt it strange that he should not make his offer through fear of vexing his mother. However, she was so anxious for the marriage itself, and still more for relief from her fears, that she believed it was so. Bitter as it was for the princess to see the unhappiness of her eldest daughter, Dolly, on the point of leaving her husband, her anxiety over the decision of her youngest daughter's fate engrossed all her feelings. Today, with Levine's reappearance, a fresh source of anxiety arose. She was afraid that her daughter, who had at one time, as she fancied, a feeling for Levine, might, from extreme sense of honor, refuse Vronsky, and that Levine's arrival might generally complicate and delay the affair so near to being concluded. "'Why, has he been here long?' the princess asked about Levine, as they returned home. "'He came to-day, mamma. "'There's one thing I want to say,' began the princess, and from her serious and alert face Kitty guessed what it would be. Mamma, she said, flushing hotly and quickly turning to her, "'please, please, don't say anything about that. I know. I know all about it.' She wished what her mother wished for, but the motives of her mother's wishes wounded her. "'I only want to say that to raise hopes. Mamma, darling, for goodness' sake, don't talk about it. It's so horrible to talk about it.' "'I won't,' said her mother." seeing the tears in her daughter's eyes. But one thing, my love, you promised me you would have no secrets from me. You won't? Never, mamma, none, answered Kitty, flushing a little, and looking her mother straight in the face. But there's no use in my telling you anything, and I, I, if I wanted to, I don't know what to say, or how. I don't know. No, she could not tell an untruth with those eyes, thought the mother, smiling at her agitation and happiness. The princess smiled that what was taking place just now in her soul seemed to the poor child so immense and so important. End of chapter 12. This recording is in the public domain.